what is true subjectively, it doesn't have to be uh, objectively verifiable. It's another type of truth. We're not talking about, uh, even in this world, it's uh, so-called objective reality is, um, how do you say, it's a, uh, a consensus among objective observers, like kilometers or miles. There's no such thing. They don't exist. I'm here to tell you that now. There's no such thing as a kilometer or a mile. It's just something we agreed upon with one another for the sake of mundane measurement. We found it convenient, so we made up something. We said a thousand of these equals one of those. That's all right, it's a good system when, when you're in the world of measurement. It's not helpful when you're trying to dealing with the immeasurable world, the Vaikuntha world which by definition is beyond mundane measurement. So all, when we say, well, when we use our mundane system of measuring, we're coming up uh, short, empty, zero. We, we, you know, we, we can't verify these things. That's correct. There, it's non-verifiable by that method. But it is by another method. And what we told Bhaktivinoda's Dasmu, Amnaya Prahat Tattvam, uh, revealed truth, descending knowledge. When the person challenged Guru Maharaj by saying, uh, if the infinite can be known by the finite, it's not infinite. Guru Maharaj's immediate retort was, if the infinite cannot make himself known to the finite, he's not infinite. And he said, sometimes he'd say, and I shook his hand and left. And the man went like, oh, <laughs> you know, like, that's uh, something to consider. That's, he understood. Guru Maharaj actually not only answered his question, but surpassed his expectation. He thought what he said was uh, unchallengeable. But Guru Maharaj responded, because we could say, just for the sake of being uh, you know, generous or exploring this subject. And he said, if the finite can know the infinite, it's not infinite. It's half true. By finite means, you cannot know what is infinite. Right? This happens to us repeatedly. Uh, I remember in school, in mathematics, one of the few times when I was actually paying attention, <laughs> that they said like, whenever I heard the word infinity, I like that, that caught my attention. And they're going like, so these numbers right here, you're like falling asleep. And then they go, but because they go on infinitely, like pi, I think pi day was the other day. So they say, but, so because it keeps going on infinitely, we put this line here at the top that stands for ad infinitum. And I thought, well, that's interesting. But there are many different versions of this. They're saying, at a certain point, it's beyond human comprehension. Right? And just as we see here, human beings have different levels of comprehension. There are the Einsteins, the Stephen Hawkins of the world, and there are other type of people. Right? So, but still, that man's point was, if the finite can know the infinite, that's not infinite. That's not infinity. It's just a very extensive version of finite. So we hear those great scientists, generally they have some humility. Einstein, Newton in particular, there, when everyone else is praising them that no one, you know, you know everything, you're the, you know, like I say about Newton, they say, you're the Einstein of your day. Okay. <laughs> You understand the point. They're saying, you're so brilliant. And what are you saying? No, like, I, what I know, and this is why it's a statement of humility, he's saying, I'm, what did he say? Like a child counting, you know, grains of sand on the shore of the ocean of truth. So he's showing some humility 
in dealing with the infinite, if one has a proper concept of it. So the man was saying, if the finite can know the infinite, that's not the infinite. It's just an extended uh, version of the finite that's beyond the conception of most finite people. But Guru Maharaj's response is so perfect and it is the basis for theistic culture. Uh, if the infinite cannot make itself known to the finite, then he's not infinite. It's his infinite capacity to do so. So it won't, what will be the method? It'll be re revelation, revealed truth, because the infinite is beyond finite comprehension. It cannot be a uh, empiric method of observation or a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. Just revelation, right? Like we're told uh, Saraswati Thakur's example, which seems like a modified version of the Socrates example. Right? A man who's, who's uh, born in a dungeon. Right? Remember, in a dungeon, there are no windows. <laughs> so born in a dungeon. How do you see things there? Uh, what's the illumination in a dungeon? By a you know, candle or a torch. So a friend from outside the dungeon comes and says, starts speaking about the sun, says, I'd like to show you the sun. The man who's lived his whole life in a dungeon says, let me grab a torch so we can see it. And I said, no, you don't understand. Uh, you don't need a torch to see the sun. Now in his world, and this is a significant part of the example, he's saying, how, what are you, crazy? You're full. What can be seen without the aid of a torch? So it's right there. What can be known without mathematics that can't be expressed in a mathematical formula? Like Descartes thinking, but not that he was an atheist, but he's saying like, anything that's true can be expressed in a mathematical formula. So then what's the mathematical formula for beauty? What's the math mathematical formula for funny? Right. What's the algorithm for funny? Oh yeah, whenever we do this algorithm, everybody laughs. No, if they, they would be uh, selling that if they had it. There is no such thing because it comes down to interpretation. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Humor is in the eye uh, or in the, wherever, where is humor located? Oh, we don't know, I forgot. <laughs> What's the mathematical formula for beauty? They, every now and then they do this, they like take these beautiful women and put their face in half and say, look, it's not the same on both sides. And if you took this side and added to the, that side, they're no longer pretty. That's interesting. Many things. So there, what, what it tells us is it's not rational. Beauty is not rational, and if in that sense you mean to say that it's irrational, then that which is irrational is not necessarily bad. There may be a plane where what is irrational, or meaning beyond what is rational, is something extraordinary. Maybe even spiritual or infinite. So anyway, back to the point, the man in the dungeon so he's saying, what can be seen without the aid of a torch? So what can be understood without logic, mathematics, rational thought? And the, the response is that, no, you don't understand the nature of the sun. You don't need that torch to illumine the sun. The so, sun is self-luminous. So you don't need logic, rationale, etc., to... Uh, uh, give illumination to divinity. He's self-revealing. They may have their place in helping us transition from the world that we're in at present, but they're, they're not necessary. So, Gromer is the infinite revealing itself to the finite. 